Monkeys running rampant in a Japanese city. The mysterious suicide of a woman in San Diego. And the story of a group of wannabe snuff filmmakers who took it too far. My name is Matt Jarbo, and you're listening to Stranger Days. Hey everyone, how's it going? Matt Jarbo here. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Today's episode is going to be full of some twists and some turns as we travel around the world, really trying to understand the weird, the wild, and the WTF from what is all around us, which is, again, one of the key reasons why I like doing this show is because of all this kind of stuff. So quick little announcement. Uh, if you guys are enjoying this, wherever you might listen, please be sure to follow me on social media. I'm at Stranger Days Pod on Instagram and TikTok, and you can find me on Twitter at mjarbo. I am working on trying to get like a website or a hub for everything to come together. But uh, if you're looking for that for just the podcast, anchor.fm forward slash Stranger Days Pod is the best way to do that. But again, this is also on iTunes and Spotify and Google Podcasts and Stitcher. So wherever you might get your podcast, please be sure to leave a like and a uh, review and uh, you know what, maybe spread it around if you can't do that. Uh, just let people know, hey, have you heard this weird uh, podcast that uh, talks about some crazy stuff? That, of course, really helps the show. So why don't we just, you know what, enough shilling aside, why don't we just dive in to the uh, the very first story here. We're going to go all the way to the city of Yamaguchi in southwestern Japan, where right now, city officials are desperately trying to stop what they say is a gang of macaque monkeys that have been carrying out a lot of attacks on local citizens since the beginning of July. What we're talking about here are bites and claws and really getting that good, good taste for human flesh and wanting more of it. And even one accusation, there's literally a part of the story that says at one point, one of these macaque monkeys tried to sneak into a nursery to literally kidnap a baby. We'll no longer be able to say the dingo ate my baby. It will be the macaque ate my baby. It just doesn't have the same ring to it, obviously. But that is something that is happening right now. These uh, monkeys are terrorizing residents of the city. They're targeting the youth, especially young children and babies. And they're even apparently hanging out near preschools, right? They're not doing it, though, in a windowless van with free candy written on the side. No, they are hanging out in the trees next to preschools, looking and surveying and scoping if they're going to be able to take home a child. This is literally happening. And the authorities are desperate to try to stop it. They have been hunting these monkeys since the attacks began. And uh, most of the injuries right now are thankfully only just like mild scratches and bites. But it's been ongoing for three weeks, over three weeks now. And so far, these macaque monkeys have actually injured almost 50 people in the city of Yamaguchi. The incidences are still being reported and the police are searching. For members of the gang, they've now identified a gang of them that they believe to be the most responsible. And this actually is this is again, this is not like some random Internet blog thing. This is coming in from an official at the local agricultural department. And this was told through an interview, uh, I believe, to the uh, Associated Press. Now, what you need to understand about these Japanese macaw monkeys is that they're really actually uh, common in large parts of Japan and in some areas are just considered like a pest. They come on in, they eat crops, they sometimes enter homes to steal stuff, but they're generally just considered a nuisance. But now they've just turned their attacks towards people. It's just not enough to sneak into someone's home and steal their food. No, the humans are now the food. These are like, they've watched way too many George Romero movies because it says that these attacks are simply just unusual. One city official has gone on record to say that it's rare to see so many attacks in this short period of time going on to say initially it was only children and women who were attacked, but recently elderly people and adult men have been targeted too. And right now they are really desperate to get this thing figured out because they've laid out traps to try to capture the macaque monkeys. The police have set patrols throughout the month of July and they've been unsuccessful. The monkeys are uh, ignoring the traps. They're evading the patrols by police. And the police are just kind of dumbfounded with what to do. I mean, even there's another report that came out that included a four-year-old girl was scratched by a macaque monkey after it broke into her apartment 
And then another one was caught entering into a kindergarten classroom. Like I said, guys, this they're not messing around. These monkeys are outright attempting to like kidnap the babies. However, however, the city decided that they needed to call in some help. So they, they, they commissioned some hunters, these very specific hunters, bounty hunters, if you will, primate bounty hunters. And they were able to track one of the male members of the gang, one primate to a local high school just recently. And they were able to corner him and they were able to trank him and capture him and bring him back in for investigation. They, they found out that this particular monkey was about four years old and it was tiny. It was only half a meter tall. These, these macaque monkeys aren't very big, so they're not really going to be able to like come up and like steal a baby or a child on their own. But I can't help but wonder if they're as coordinated as an ant colony, you know, where ants can lift 50 times their own weight. And if enough of them come up and they can, they can lift something big and carry it back to the nest, you know, you have to really kind of wonder about that. But what they were able to do is once they captured the macaque monkey, uh, they, they put it down. Now I'm not the biggest fan of that, to be honest with you. I understand why it's necessary in this particular case, but this is where they're at. They just, they're at their wits end. So they're going to go on a macaque monkey massacre. That's going to be the big thing that's going to happen next year. Uh, right now, the authorities have really been asking though, why there's that question. Now they've caught, they've caught one, they've, they've euthanized it. And they're still trying to figure out like why this is happening. Because originally the macaque monkey was actually a pretty vulnerable species. But recently there's been like a large population boom. They've been getting busy. And that's great. So this has actually been one of the reasons why there has been conflict with people. And this is actually coming in from a research paper from Yamagata University that says that the changes in human behavior and forest environment have actually somewhat pushed these monkeys to respond the way that they have. They're losing their home, so they're coming into civilization and they're just messing things up. So obviously, who's going to win this fight? I think we all know. We all absolutely know who's going to win this fight. It's going to be the humans with the tranquilizers and the guns. But it actually really does kind of speak to the overall concept of deforestation and the rapidly evolving uh, presence on the planet, how many people are here now. Just as a quick side note, because this is kind of an information-based podcast at times, what you have to realize is that from 1979 to 1999, our world population doubled from 3 billion to 6 billion. And from 1999 to 2022, we've gone from 6 billion to 8 billion. So we have heavily increased a lot of people in the past 40 years. We're talking well over double the global population that is going to have an impact on the environment. And this is the environment fighting back. So very curious to see what happens in Japan, but I thought this was a little bit of a weird story and one I wanted to share with you. So as always, I do want to hear your thoughts. So let me know what you think about this one, because what do you think is going to happen with the monkeys? Will they be eventually snuffed out and will the potentiality of a planet of the apes type situation happen in southwestern Japan? Let me know. All right, so moving on from Japan, we're going to travel all the way across the Pacific to San Diego, California, my home away from home, to talk about the mysterious death of Rebecca Zahau. Now, Rebecca Zahau was a Burmese immigrant. She was born March 15th, 1979 in northwestern Burma. Not too much is actually known about her childhood, but she moved around a little bit with her family, living in Nepal, in Germany, and then her family moved to the United States in the early 2000s. She eventually found her way to Arizona, where in 2008 she began dating a millionaire by the name of Jonah Shacknai, who was the CEO of Medicis Pharmaceutical. Now, Jonah had two previous marriages, the latter of which produced his six-year-old son, Max. And a couple years later, July 11th, 2011, Rebecca, Max, and Rebecca's teenage sister, Zena, were hanging out at Spreckles Mansion in Coronado, California, which Shaknai used as a summer estate. What you need to know about Coronado is that this is a very 
ritzy place in San Diego. You have a couple military bases that are right there, but it's mostly a retiree community and a place for a lot of very well-to-do individuals. Believe me, I'm pretty sure I'm wanted by cops in Coronado based upon the time I spent there as a young lad with some rambunctious friends. But Coronado is very pretty, but I understand that there's a lot of money there. So this mansion may not be the biggest mansion you'll have ever seen, but it's actually a pretty decent sized mansion for the area, and it is very nice. But on July 11th, 2011, tragedy struck, because at some point during that day, while Rebecca was in the shower, Max fell face first over the second floor banister, suffering injuries to his spinal cord and facial bones. And the impact from the damage to his spinal cord impacted his heart rate and breathing. Rebecca's sister, Zena, found Max a few moments later and immediately contacted 911. And when Rebecca went to hold Max, she found that he was not breathing and unresponsive. And from there, he was taken to Children's Hospital in San Diego. The next day, on July 12, 2011, Rebecca dropped off Zena at the airport for her flight back to Missouri and then picked up Jonah's brother, Adam, who had just arrived on a flight from Memphis, Tennessee, to come and console the family. After that, Rebecca, Jonah, and Adam had dinner with a friend of theirs, and then Adam and Rebecca returned to the mansion while Jonah went back to the children's hospital to stay by Max's side. We don't know what happened after Rebecca and Adam returned to the mansion, but there were reports of loud music coming from the home later in the night. But then the next morning, July 13th at approximately 6.45 a.m., Adam supposedly exited from his room and he found Rebecca's nude body hanging from a balcony. Her wrists and ankles had been bound and her hands were tied behind her back. He immediately contacted the authorities three minutes later. He then weirdly just sent a text message to Jonah, letting him know that his long-term girlfriend had just committed suicide. And then even weirder, he pulled out a knife and he cut Rebecca down from the balcony before the police arrived. Paramedics tried to revive her, but she was pronounced dead at the scene. Police did conduct an investigation. They did conduct forensic and toxicology testing on her body as part of the autopsy to determine the cause of death. But speculations of foul play began really early on as news began to spread, and investigators were not able to find any other DNA at the scene outside of Rebecca's house. But then, about a month and a half later, the San Diego County Sheriff's Department formally announced that, based upon their autopsy, they confirmed that Rebecca Zahau had committed suicide. But to make matters worse, a few days after Rebecca had killed herself, Max succumbed to his injuries of brain damage caused by oxygen deprivation on July 16th. The kicker here is that the San Diego Sheriff did announce that Zahau's death was ruled a suicide and that Max's death had been ruled an accident and there was no foul play indicated at all. But members of Rebecca's family disputed the findings and actually filed a $10 million wrongful death lawsuit against Adam Shacknai. Rebecca's family's lawyer argued that Shacknai had sexually assaulted her and then killed her before staging her death to make it look like a suicide. And the crazy thing is that the jury in the civil trial found Adam Shacknai responsible for her death and actually granted the family a $5 million judgment for the loss of love and companionship, as well as an additional $167,000 for the loss of financial support that Rebecca would have been providing to her mother and her siblings. So it's crazy that they found him guilty in a civil trial when the authorities claimed it to be a suicide and there being no foul play indicated. However, in February of 2019, Adam Shacknai did appeal the judgment with defense, arguing that there was juror misconduct and procedural errors, but the insurance company not wanting to lose that $5 million or $10 million stepped in with what they probably deemed to be a pretty generous settlement offer for $600,000 and the family accepted it, basically resulting in the case being dismissed with prejudice, meaning that they cannot refile that wrongful death lawsuit again. And as of now, there is still no answer as to whether or not Adam Shacknai will be charged by San Diego authorities 
despite his brother begging the sheriff of San Diego to conduct a formal investigation into Rebecca Zhao's suicide. I mean, my take on it is that it seems that the guy who found her probably had something to do with it. If he was able to cover his tracks well enough and not leave any kind of forensic evidence behind, then yeah, it's going to make it pretty difficult. But in a civil trial, the preponderance of evidence is much less than a criminal one. And I mean, at this point now, all the news knows if you Google Adam Shackney, what happened while he has not been convicted of the crime, the court of public opinion is quite frankly, way more hardcore uh, than the court of law. So I hope one day there's justice if there's justice to be had. That being said, let's talk about justice because I want to then travel to Flint, Michigan, where a group of young filmmakers attempted to recreate the sensation of Blair Witch, but it's a prank that went ultimately wrong and has had pretty disastrous results. So the story starts in March 2002 when Danielle Taylor, who was a 19-year-old Taco Bell cashier living in Flint, Michigan, made the acquaintance of a young man named Travis Payea, who was a 20-year-old student at the nearby Mott Community College who had dreams fanciful dreams of becoming a screenwriter and a director dreams of which believe me i share with him i used to live in la work tried to work as a writer i get it i understand the desire but not to this degree now paella lived in flint with a fellow student and a horror movie buff his friend named john cockerill and their apartment was kind of the central hub for where their friends would hang out friends like james carwile christina lum and derek faxlinger people who are all involved in the story. But on the night of March 6, 2002, during what was apparently Danielle Taylor's second or third time visiting the apartment, she was either willingly or unwillingly bound, handcuffed, blindfolded, threatened with bodily harm, bundled into a car, driven to an open field, placed in a small disused fire pit that was doubling as a shallow grave, and told that she was being buried alive. The whole thing was being recorded on camera as a snuff film perpetuated by a wannabe filmmaker with delusions of grandeur and wanting to very much emulate the 1999 successful point of view found footage documentary, The Blair Witch Project. Now, the videotape, which was shot by Travis Poyea, opens in the house with Taylor prominently featured saying hi to the camera. And then shortly thereafter, Carwile and Cockerell wrestle her to the ground and proceed to bind her with tape. In the recording, Paella and the others are heard making numerous threats. At one point, Taylor says, it hurts. And an off-camera voice responds, hey, it hurts, right? Well, think about it. A half hour from now, you'll never feel another thing. Then the person not visible on the tape adds, enjoy the pain. That's the last thing you'll ever feel. Now, this is where, for me, things get a little bit on the weird side, because if I was in a situation where a group of my friends or supposed friends had bound me and blindfolded me and told me I was just going to die in the next 30 minutes, I would be relatively upset, right? I think we all can kind of agree with that. But apparently, from people who have seen the tape here, Taylor seems rather kind of nonchalant about it. Maybe impassive is a good word. It's a word that the article uses. But at other times, she was genuinely upset and frightened as she tried and was unable to get up from beneath the two men. Now, I have claustrophobia, so I completely understand the fear of not being able to move around. I can't stand it. That might be what we were seeing here. Or perhaps she was at this point realizing that maybe this wasn't a joke. Maybe this was real. Maybe this was what's going to be happening. Because at one point, she actually says, you guys are effing psycho. And then the man's voice responds with, you realize just in time, this is your film debut. They load Taylor in the car and they take her for a short car ride out to where they have dug this shallow grave. Then they tell her that if she says one more word, it will be her last and that they are burying her alive. One of them saying on the tape, you are going to die. Then they make her sit in the middle of this four foot deep grave, blinded with her head held low. And they start shoveling snow on her and dirt and just covering her. 
But then all of a sudden it just kind of feels like it hits this natural endpoint where it's like, well, why are we here? What is happening? What's going on? This has maybe now gone too far. The joke is over. It's no longer funny. Because they just kind of pick her up and remove the blindfold and effectively just say something on the lines of fooled you. Because then they just like shoot the credit sequence, which is really just Taylor as the victim. And a few minutes later, Taylor complains that she is cold and her arms are sore. And according to some of the reports I read after that, they all just got back in the car and they went back to Travis's place and hung out. But this is where things take a turn because the next morning Taylor had a doctor's appointment. And while she was there getting checked out, the doctor noticed that she had these mysterious bruises on her wrists and general complaints of soreness and pain. And her doctor was like, well, this seems kind of weird. Maybe you should report this to the police, which she did the following day. Travis Payea then hits up Taylor and he's like, hey, come on over. You want to see the movie? You want to see a screening of the movie? So she goes back over to the apartment, despite the fact that the police with whom she'd already filed the report had told her, don't do this. Don't don't contact these people. Don't have any, you know, don't talk to them whatsoever. But she goes back over there. She attends the screening of this snuff film. And when she was given a spare moment alone with the VCR unattended, she quickly ejected it, swiped it, and she ran back and handed it over to the cops. The cops then looked at the tape as being evidence of a kidnapping and violence and all the other stuff. And they arrested them a couple days later. Now, Derek Faxlinger was released on a personal bond because he never actually went out to the, to the shallow grave. He stayed back at the apartment, but everybody else who was there, they were held on a $500,000 bond because the judge had assessed that the tape was repulsive and sadistic, which it clearly was based upon what I've seen. However, not all is bad right away because Travis and the friends actually benefited from pretty strong support from the community many of whom seemed to understand that this was actually a group of basically good kids who were doing something very stupid for shock value and were trying to make a movie for shock value, one that they could use to propel their potential careers. And back in that time, people, you know, and again, even for the next like 10 years, while the internet was emerging as being this edgy, crazy place, so many people tried to do this kind of stuff. I've done stupid things on the internet back then trying to be edgy as a way to get attention. Never this, never this. I've done my own stupid stuff, but never this. However, there was a weird thought process in the community where they actually believed that Taylor had a bit of a romantic interest in Travis Payea and that he rebuffed her, that he was like, he wasn't interested. He, he just, you know, liked her, but did not in that way. And then she took her revenge by filing this police report and turning it over to the cops. Now, I have no way of knowing if that is true, but there's been other reports online that have kind of circulated from people who have seen interviews with her, and they believe that this is something more in line with what really could have happened. But again, I have no way of knowing, and I am in no way trying to say that that is what happened. It just seems to me that what we're looking at here is a situation where not all the information is out there and it was very heavily one-sided against people who clearly acted stupid and pranked in the worst possible way. And this is the consequence. But here's the other kicker with this. The Salon article that I'm pulling from actually saw the tape. And they make a passage here that's fascinating. They say Taylor never quite gave the performance that they were looking for if it was real. At one point, she says all the right things, you know, when they're threatening her, you know, beg, having her beg or whatever. She says she loves her mom. She'll miss her family. But it's kind of muted. It's not big enough. It's not theatrical enough. It's not going to get you. She's not acting in a way that's going to be like big and massive and crazy. Taylor kind of seems, again, according to the Salong article, that she's holding back 
still confused about like how scared she's supposed to be on camera. And when they ask what she thinks of them, her, you know, assailants, people that she thought were her friends that have kidnapped her and beat her and, and thrown dirt and snow and are burying her alive in a shallow grave. She basically says, yeah, I really don't have much to say to you guys, which is just a weird thing to say in general, but all right. But even before this, when she really wasn't giving them what, what they wanted out of the whole scenario, there was a moment back at the house where she had asked for a favor, like, and they probably thought like, oh, this is it. We're going to get like the moment. This is her going to be pleading and crying. This is, this is the money shot. And like, as a final request, she actually like asks if they can take her car back to her sister. Like, yeah, once you kill me, please just take my car back to my sister. That'd be great. And then Travis Pay is like, is that it? I, is that, this it? And you can like, you can apparently, according to the article, you can hear that there's like disappointment in his voice. Like that's, that's your car to your sister. Like, really? Like, we're going to kill you. What the hell's going on here? And he says, if you had one last wish to make, would it be that your sister has this car? And then Taylor goes, yeah, because she has kids. And I effing need her to have that car. Okay, right? That to me is hysterical. But the outcome wasn't hysterical. And I think we need to kind of touch upon that for a second. So the only information I can find about what happened is just a little snippet from a Tumblr blog. But this is what they say. They say, Eventually, Christina Lum accepted a plea bargain on a reduced charge of attempted felonious assault and received a six-month suspended sentence pending the completion of her probation. On a reduced charge, Derek Faxlinger was ordered to pay $200, but the other three people pled no contest to kidnapping and assault. Jimmy Carwile received a four-month sentence, while Paella and Cockerill each got eight months, but all suspended sentences following the completion of probation. So it could have been a lot worse and it kind of got a lot worse over the course of the next couple years, Derek Flaxinger, Jonathan Cockerill and Travis Paella have all died. Travis took his own life four years later in 2006. Now I can't find information as to why they took their own lives. I can't find anything on that. And I don't want to overly speculate because it's a tragic story across the board. It's one of those things where people out there see what's popular and they try to emulate it in order to find success off of it. These guys thinking, let's make a snuff film in the early 2000s as a way to try to capitalize on the success of the Blair Witch Project ultimately found them in a world of hell and it had very tragic outcomes. I wish that they would have found an actress and actually done the right thing of making this as professional as possible because you're not going to get the reaction you want when it's fake and the other person doesn't know that. You might think it's going to go one way, but if there's any hesitation on your end and the other person picks up on it, kind of like how Danielle here did, it not going to go the way you want. But as always, I'm curious to know your guys' thoughts on this, so definitely let me know. And that actually wraps up today's episode of the show. These are some interesting stories. Psychotic monkeys out of Japan, a mysterious death in San Diego, and a bunch of idiots trying to recreate a popular movie that wound up having serious, tragic endings. If you have anything you'd like me to cover, any story you'd like me to look into to give my thoughts on, Please find me on social media, as I mentioned before. I'll be back with another episode very soon. Thank you again for listening to Stranger Days. Have a good one and peace out.